hey, some of you may disagree with me, but I've never been enthusiastic about the practice of drawing up a so-called prenuptial agreement. That's a prerequisite for marriage. Uh, you know, that, that's where the bride and the groom agree to certain conditions whereby they are married. And then, once they are married, if, if either of them violate any of those conditions, the marriage can be legally terminated. I checked out premarital agreements online and discovered that most prenuptial agreements mainly concern themselves with what happens if the marriage is ended. Who will get the children, the car, the house, the pets, and who will not? Seems odd to go into a marriage with this much effort given to the prospect that the marriage won't last. <laughs> Isn't that a, a bit pessimistic? Prenuptial agreements are particularly strange if one compares them with what couples promise in the marriage ceremony itself. The promises of marriage are noted for being utterly unconditional. You know, better or worse, richer for poorer, sickness or health. The church traditionally has couples to promise to stay married no matter what, without any ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, unconditionally. No church I know would marry someone who said, I take you as my lawfully wedded husband to have and to hold from this day forward if you fill in the blanks, uh, always vote the way I vote, root for my NFL team, or share my favorite color. To say, I love you if you, well, that isn't considered much love at all. True love is unconditional, without ifs, ands, or buts. Yet, is that really the case with love? For most of us, the most complete unconditional love we've ever known is that of our mothers. Most mothers love their children unconditionally, no matter what. Oh, the child may disappoint, disobey, wander, but still, the mother continues to love in spite of the child's inability to love well. But most of us can also testify that the most demanding, taxing, tough love we've ever known is that of our mothers. How nice of you to call, she says. Then I wondered if I was going to hear from you this week or if you would forget me are you eating well? Getting enough sleep? You sound like you're, you're eating too much junk food. You know that's bad for you, and I tell you, I know successful, middle-aged, powerful men who still wouldn't dare risk using bad language or lighting up a cigarette in front of their mothers. Demanding, taxing, tough to be sure, but you know why they do it. It's out of love. Love's not love that has no expectations for the behavior of the beloved. Our mothers not only tend to love us, but also to have high expectations for us, to believe the best about us, and to count on receiving the best from us. It's just not quite right to call that sort of love unconditional. There are conditions, terms, stipulations, and expectations, precisely because there is such deep, complete love. It has been said that the supreme example of complete, steadfast, unconditional love is the love that God has for Israel. Without Israel doing anything to deserve God's love, early on, God makes a promise to love Israel, to stick with Israel, no matter what, to make a great people out of this ragtag group of nomads, Exodus 6, 7. Without asking to be loved, without doing anything to be lovable, God comes to the Hebrew children 
I will be your God. You will be my people. Period. Unconditionally. Has said. It means steadfast love. It's a favorite biblical way of speaking of God's continuing, never-ending love for Israel. And yet, it's not quite right to call such divine love unconditional, particularly in the light of this Sunday's Old Testament lesson from the prophet Isaiah. The prophet speaks for God. Listen up! I want the whole world to know that I am angry with you. I created you. I, I delivered you from enslavement. I led you through the desert. I gave you land, and, and yet you, you do whatever you want. You oppress all your workers. You quarrel and brawl. You hit each other violently with your fists. Economic exploitation of workers, civil unrest and violence. The faithful fast, and they make a big show of, of their regret and their repentance. They, they pray, they sing, they process, they use high-sounding religious words in the sanctuary, but then disregard the justice of God in the way they conduct their business. And Isaiah the prophet contrasts Israel's pious worship with their actual economic and power practices. I don't want your praise choruses, your fasts, your bowing and scraping and worship. I want justice, says the Lord. And then God says up front what God wants, expects. And here come the conditions, the terms, the stipulations and specifications that God has for God's people. If you open your heart to the hungry, if you provide abundantly for those who are afflicted. <laughs> Sorry if you thought that faith in God was mostly a spiritual matter. You don't like the mixing of religion and politics. Uh, you're surprised by this linkage of worship with economics, this harsh contrast with our pious religious words and our actual treatment of those who are hungry and afflicted. Hey, this is love, Yahweh, God of Israel style. If you were here last Sunday, maybe you, you heard Prophet Micah link worship and ethics. You heard God say that our faithless behavior in the world, Monday through Saturday, can negate our faith talk in church on Sunday. Well, Isaiah speaks a similar word like that on this Sunday. God loves Israel and the church so much that God loves conditionally. I will be your God. You will be my people. If you show the world what it's like to be loved by a God who loves the hungry and the afflicted, and who judges those who make violence against their neighbors or who oppress the vulnerable among them? Well, that's not exactly right. It's not that Yahweh, God of Israel, says, uh, I will love you if you open your heart to the hungry and provide for those who are afflicted. But rather, it's more, I love you completely, abundantly, and steadfastly, Therefore, live as those who have been gifted by my love. Okay, back to my opening analogy of the promises of marriage. Don't you find it interesting that it's never been enough for the church to hear two people say to one another, I love you. The church has always said, in effect, uh, you say that you love one another? Well, what does that actually mean in real life? So the church insists that we give substance to our declarations of love by specifying the conditions under which our expressions of love are exemplified. The church insists that couples promise to love in wealth and in poverty, in sickness and in health, 
in agreement and in disagreement, in happiness and in sadness. Love that is able to love like that is true love indeed. In other words, the promises of marriage are conditioned by a promise to love unconditionally. Love without specifications, conditions, and terms, that's hardly love. How many people have rejected the Christian faith? Not because they have considered and then rejected Christ, but rather they have watched us, the presumed lovers and followers of Christ, make our public declarations of love for Christ well, here in church on Sunday morning, but then they observed us at work, our behavior toward others, in the office, or the way we mistreated fellow students at school, or the hurtful things we said about people, and they were scandalized by that great gap between our declarations of love for Christ and the way our daily lives diverged from the way of Christ. Let's say that uh, we're here this morning because we love God and we want to be close to God, and that's good. But there are conditions. What are the terms? What is the specific therefore that God sets before us? The prophet Micah put it succinctly last week. What does the Lord's love require? To do justice, to embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God.